I'll start by acknowledging country. We're on unceded Aboriginal land, um, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and all First Nations people um, that are involved with this conference and with the organisations um, that participated in last night's event. Always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, my name's Joel Stern. Um, I'll be one of the moderators um, for the panel. My colleague, Laura McLean's over there. We chose the red uh, chairs. <laughs> Kettling, <laughs> the, um, Kettling the artists <laughs> into exactly. conversation. Um, and we're joined this morning by artists um, Rosalind Orlando, next to me here, Emile Zeal, Tom Smith, and Sean Docre. Um, and so what this um, conversation this morning is doing is really um, a kind of, it's sort of part two of um, the part one, which was the event the night before, um, an event at Miscellanea, which is a performance space and club um, right across the road from where we are now at RMIT. And it was, it was an event called Logical Conclusions, Automation Effects. Um, and I suppose it was, um, you know, the, the event within this um, ADMS symposium that tried to put artistic practice, experimental practice and performance um, to, to the forefront as a kind of um, methodology um, and a modality for dealing with questions of automation. Um, and, and, you know, when Laura and I were conceiving of this event and kind of developing the idea al along with Professor Mark Andreevich um, at the center, we were really thinking about how automation, it's not just a sort of thing that exists in the world, it's, it's something that sort of has to be performed, you know, over and over in sort of every um, discrete context in every instance. Um, and that sort of performance of automation you know, we were thinking about the ways in which the sort of critical practices and reflexive practices of performance um, are, are sort of, in a way, um, the way that artists can sort of take automation um, and foreground its performativity and kind of, in a way, produce it as a critical and an aesthetic practice through their works. So the invitation um, was to perform automation and to perform the cultural logic of automation um, all the way through to its logical conclusions and to kind of wield automation as, as an effect, um, as something <clears throat> that sort of has effects but in itself is an effect. Um, and so do you want to add to that, Laura, in terms of providing context of what, what we plan to do over the course of the next hour or so is, is invite the artists to um, reflect on their practice and how their works sort of responded to that invitation. Yeah, no, that was a really great introduction. Thanks, Joel. Um, one thing I think is something we could kind of chat about over this panel, which is kind of making more explicit what you're already saying, is the way that artistic practice can be a really complex form of research um, that can kind of reveal um, and bring to light aspects of automation in this case that kind of can't be got at through um, other forms of research. I think that's kind of something that's really important to forefront in this forum this week. Super. Yeah. Um, so it's an intimate audience here on um, the Thursday morning. I just thought I'd um, ask who, who, um, who's with us. He was, was actually at the event last night and so has some familiarity with the works. Okay. Just a couple of you. So in that case, we'll do our best to, um, you know, not to, to not just refer to the works in passing, but really to describe them in their totality. And um, feel free at, at any time um, to sort of pose questions or to sort of um, ask for a little bit more explanation of something if you feel like we've moved through it too quickly. Um, and so we wanted to invite each um, artist in turn to introduce their practice in the sort of um, um, broad terms, but then move quickly onto the question of how the work that they presented last night 
um, deals with this idea of the logic of automation, um, and in doing so, you, you know, in, introduce the work um, and describe it. So um, maybe Rosalind, you're <laughs> <laughs> right here next to me. If I could invite you to, to go first. Sure. Um, so yes, my name is Rosalind Orlando, and I present uh, my work. Broadly speaking, uh, is performance based, and um, I my practice is very interested in the intersection between language and technology, and the way that technology generates language and uh, words that are chosen through automated processes, and how these constructs change the way that we um, think what the kinds of words that are available to us through these automated processes and how um, they yeah, change the way that we think, communicate, act, behave, looking at that at kind of architecturally to think about um, yeah, the relationship between language and technology. So that's kind of broad brush strokes. And then often what I do is I will either generate a script using uh, programs like in the early days, it was just kind of like text prediction, really basic um, stuff that felt really, it was always really glitchy and fun and surreal. Uh, and over the years, as technology has become more sophisticated, the scripts have become increasingly more sophisticated themselves and the language has become more complex and less funny, more eerie. Um, and so I've, over the last 10 years, really been kind of tracking that progression of language and technology and how, where it's learning from us, but also how we're learning from it. So I'll generate a script, maybe using these days GPT-3 or um, other forms of text generation that are kind of um, now readily available to us. And then I will conduct a close reading of the text and perform it. Uh, either solo or with a group of performers, um, and that's what I did last night. But last night's script was a departure from me because I used a verbatim script that uh, was a conversation between Lambda, which is, a, you probably all know, the, the Google neural network chatbot, and Blake Lemoyne, who is a Google researcher who recently um, tried to claim that the chatbot had achieved sentience, that murky term. Uh, so we re-performed an excerpt of the conversation, uh, and by we, I mean it was performed with four other people as a kind of choir, and three people played uh, Lambda, and two people played Lemoyne, and uh, using different various vocal techniques uh, and ways of kind of inter interpreting the words, we tried to draw attention to some of the underlying layers of meaning, the underlying constructs, and the kind of politics um, of the script, and, and the inherent biases and such um, other other elements. Um, and, and it was quite a funny, you know, entertaining kind of jaunt through what had been said between them. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Rosalind. And, um Lots of questions um, come up, you know, not, not least about sort of what it means to um, take a sort of verbatim transcript fr from um, a kind of computer science space and restage it as um, a kind of uh, composition or theatre. Um, but w I think what we'll do is we'll move quickly through each of um, the artists and then come back to sort of draw upon the common threads. Um, so now, Emil, if, if we could invite you to speak. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, Emile Zeal, artist and filmmaker, <clears throat> currently uh, kind of <clears throat> just recently ex expelled and <laughs> like on the floor after being birthed by RMIT's PhD program, <laughs> the uh, Digital Ethnography Research Center. So yeah, I'm in this kind of strange place where I'm kind of unlearning things and getting back to other things. Um, in my arts practice, I use performance to inhabit these uh, yeah, forms of machine translation, machine learning. I think we're all interested in language on this panel. It's yeah, a giant part of the kind of conceptual framework of these devices. 
Um, I'm interested in humans, not so much the technology. So I see the kind of reflections back from the technology as what I'm interested in, in a kind of a kind of documentary way almost. Um, the performance I performed last night was telling these stories to capture um, web authentication panels that, yeah, weaving this, trying to weave this uh, empathetic story around <clears throat> humanity behind these uh, automated images that come from, uh, yeah, road tracking, Google tracking, Nine Eyes machinery. And that was a kind of a humanist monologue that I was delivering to these images behind me. And on top of that was this punchy audio track that just inserted itself like an unwanted guest at your party. <laughs> it's like punching through this kind of obscene language coming from the internet, um, kind of overtly sexual, uh, yeah, this kind of sort of black ooze sort of that drips out of the uh, computer and in your, f in your face. So, um, yeah, as a kind of like infrastructural kind of level, I'm thinking about how the experience of using the internet affects me and how the kind of immediate context shifts change my experience of using the internet. So that was the decision there to have this kind of rude uh, obscenity, just, yeah, spilling out and uh, making itself known. Um, yeah, that's... Those um, sort of pornographic interventions mm. were, were a bit like the sort of internet's unconscious mm. id. Yeah. You know, just <laughs> yeah. breaking through. Yeah, yeah. And A friend of mine asked if they were prompted by what you were saying, um, if they were kind of triggered by your narrative. Uh, Is that the case, or did they just kind of pop up? No, they, they weren't triggered. They were on a timeline, but I planned the timeline roughly to hit the kind of tempo and the, the duration that I was aiming for. Um, yeah, so this kind of emotional, sexual undercurrent to the internet, yeah, I wanted to represent in that way of this sort of emotional bile that uh, gets released, whether you like it or not. And just for um, comprehensibility's sake, um, when you mentioned before that you were drawing on um, capture mm -hmm. authentication images yep. um, as sort of ready-mades for mm -hmm. constructing the, your narrative, um, I've, I've explained that to a few people, and every time um, we've got stuck on the word capture, because mm -hmm. it's a difficult word mm -hmm. to, to, because, you know, um, it's not C-A-P-T-U-R-E, capture and control. It's um, capture, which is a sort of very specific made up mm. kind of web security word, which is what C-A-P- E-T-C-H-A, yeah. T-C-H-A. Mm. And so just to clarify, we're, we're talking about those images which present a panel with sort of nine small images and asks you to identify each one containing a truck or a train. Yeah. And also that, that request to present yourself not as a bot, mm. like it's kind of deeply sad, like I am not a robot, like I find there's yeah, just depths of human <laughs> pathos and emotion in this weird request that we have to justify ourselves to these machine Mm. Uh, infrastructures, yeah. I'm not a robot. So both a form of capture and a form of escape. Yeah, two forms of capture, perhaps. Yeah. Mm. Tom Smith? Um, yeah. Um, I made a, a video work or a short film, or I'm not quite sure what to call it, but I made a, a kind of experimental science fiction narrative, um, which was developed as part of a program that Laura um, here organized called Capture Raw, and um, it sort of imagines like a streaming platform of the future that seamlessly automates the production of content um, based on our own data sets. And so I suppose in, in the sort of lineage of my research was just kind of looking at modes of production or 
sort of capitalism in general and the way that it is always trying to, um, what's the word, subsume or, or commodify or more and more sort of fundamental qualities of the human, I suppose, and like looking at the way that online economies are always trying to capture desires in, in more and more efficient ways. So sort of thinking that through to its log log uh, you know, real logical conclusion, we, uh, you know, uh, thinking about what a, a sort of platform designer would want to uh, potentially do if they, if they could and sort of, um, so yeah, the, the video kind of explains the history of this platform and goes through like the data set of this hypothetical user and the, the things that they like and then kind of tries to, to visualize that. Um, so, yeah, um, and, I, and I got really, during the lockdown when I was, you know, stuck in my house, I, I had never really been much of a gamer, but I got obsessed with, with like AAA games and, you know, like big PlayStation titles and stuff, so I kind of got, got it in my head that that would be the best way to visualize it using a game engine, and so I sort of taught myself to use Unreal Engine, which is like a popular game engine that developers use to make games. So, because I, I wanted, to, wanted it to have this sort of uncanny valley kind of little bit glitchy, but pretty realistic kind of feel. Um, and that took months, but I got there in the end. And yeah, is that, is that good as a description or? Yeah, no, that was great. Play. We've got a short excerpt from Narrative 001. Should we play that now? Give people a taste? Yeah, if, 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 if that works in the I think, it, I think it can work. <coughs> I think it'll just come up in a sec. So yeah, this, this section is sort of the section Images. where the Synthesized serrator is players. listing Massive the multiplayer things that online games. <laughs> Elevation. Our the 135 chord progression. A major chord and a minor progression. Montage. Library music. Fever dream sequences. Flashbacks. Explosive action sequences. Extended drones, compression artifacts, parallel dimensions, the Escovite sample pack, critical theory, accurate prose, people explaining things as clearly as possible, open world environments, arpeggios, ambiguous music, data visualization, speculative fictions, the uncanny valley, moderate reverberation, dotted rhythms, harmonic distortion, philosophy of technology. Portals, thresholds, liminal spaces, airport bars, Dolby surround test sequences. Um, yes, so that list kind of goes on and on and on. And it was just, I mean, I guess like the, this person is, is me ultimately, but I tried to put things in there that I don't like so that it, it would be a bit scrambled. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then. And that piece um, is going to be published sort of online soon, isn't it? It is, yeah. It should be next week in um, Liquid Architecture's online journal Disclaimer. Um, so I've been working with Tom and um, five other artists from Australia and India for the last year with this program called Capture All. And they've put together some really amazing work um, for this dossier. So um, if you sign up to Liquid Architecture's mailing list, you can um, be alerted of that in the near future and watch the whole, um, watch the whole video of Tom's and others. And Tom, um, that work sort of takes you imaginatively sort of into the fairly distant future. It, it's, yeah, it's set in 21. 21, 43, I think was the date I chose. Um, I don't know, I kind of reasoned that I didn't want it to be like too near future because it's not like, I don't necessarily think that a platform like this will ever exist or, but it, I mean, it, it might, but. I wanted to, to put it a little bit far off so it wasn't so kind of like, I don't know, the, the, so the, the claims maybe seem less outlandish or something. Right. Maybe. I'm not sure why I came up with that date. I just kind of figured that maybe <clears throat> it just seemed like it might take that long, just intuitively. <laughs> um, there's a classic, you know, meme that, li that shows sort of all of the speculative science fiction texts sort of chronologically dated with, you know, you are here in 2022, sort of 
somewhere in the middle of both the history of speculative sci-fi and its kind of putative future. But I think we're all sort of um, in the business of diagnosing the present in order to speculate on the future in, in some way. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I, I think like even though a platform that does that so seamlessly is sort of science fiction, I think you know, the platforms that we use try to do the same thing in like a manual way, you know, sort of. Yeah. Our, 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 we're, we're, our desires are exploited, you know. That's a, through prediction and modeling. Through prediction and content and, you know, just this almost like automatic thing where we desire connection and communication and all these basic things and we get that we get those things through those platforms. So um, it's not such a leap that that might become automated in a sense. Mm. Like, um, One thing I like about your work is that it's not, I mean, it's kind of implicitly critical, um, but it's kind of ambiguous in its criticality. Like it acknowledges that people, lots, like people can opt out of Worldio, but lots of people just find it a really satisfying experience and yeah. choose to opt in. Um, much like as we it. do now, where something might be enjoyable or convenient, we're like, oh, I know they're like, you know, extracting our data and selling it, but it's quite nice using this platform. Or yeah, like I didn't want to make something that was sort of obviously dystopian, or even though it is obviously dystopian, I don't know. I wanted there to be this kind of element to it, where it's like people would enjoy that and they would they would participate in it in it willingly, and all various as we move through time, there's always dystopian and utopian elements to everything that's going on, like, you know, so I wanted it to, to feel that way, like, and maybe this would be nice, even if it's really creepy, <laughs> or like, you know, coercive, or, you know, to sort of sit in between somewhere. Um, yeah. So, the, um, it's a good segue into Sean Dockray's work, which is also, kind of about the, you know, logic of platformization or the sort of platformization of, of life, social life, especially. Um, of course, not all of your work is about that, but the work that you presented last night, you know, it explicitly was. Would you, you know, in, introduce your practice and then kind of the piece, Sean? Sure. Hello. It works. <laughs> I've never had one of these before. Um, so I'm Sean Dockery, uh, and <clears throat> I was thinking about the overall introduction. I was thinking about how um, I got onto the internet when I was uh, 18, like right when I turned 18. I think it might have even been related to my birthday. I was on AOL. And um, so I, I think it's something about that like, particular moment that um, just made me like, pay really close attention to the internet. Like, in, in general, and um, and so from that kind of moment on, I don't know. I've just been hyper attentive to like the ways that being on the internet like changes like a whole lot of like um, you know the way I relate to other people, the way that I work, um, the way that I you know watch movies, what I like to do, and so on and so on. Uh, I mean, this is not just me, obviously. It's everyone. Um, so that that thing that you said earlier about diagnosing the present, I think for me that's like uh, one aspect of um, the work that I try to make is, is just in this observation, just finding tools to be able to kind of like make sense and understand like what, what is happening. So uh, I tend to do writing and programming as like my entry point into um, that. Uh, and alternatively, um, like rather than just diagnosing, I do also, I'm really interested in finding ways to, I don't know, like shift that, like if, if there's possibilities for, for, you know, changing that, that sort of like what seems to be an inevitable um, course and advancement of automation. Um, so I have um, some other parts yeah, of my practice that are more related to doing that. So. With that said, uh, last night, <clears throat> um, last night, w what I had done is sort of based in, a, in an old text that I'd written in 2010 
<coughs> Sorry, I still have COVID in my voice cords. I mean, not, I don't have COVID, I just have <laughs> uh, effects of it. Um, which was called the Facebook Suicide Bomb Manifesto. And at the time, a lot of people were, were like saying, oh, you got to get off Facebook. Like, how can we, like, how do you quit Facebook? How do you get off social networks? And to me, it seemed like the wrong question to be asking, that if you just like removed yourself, that you weren't actually doing all that much. Uh, so uh, th this text was like a provocation, saying that uh, a social network needs a kind of like social suicide. And the, the language of, of suicide in that case was based on, that was the language that was being used. There was this like Facebook suicide machine or something. And the idea being that when you removed your profile, that's what was happening. So I was saying, um, um, proposing this alternative within that text, which was about um, kind of like a pr proliferation of, um, of data and clicking and action so that your sort of profile became this watered down, meaningless mass of nothing um, and everything all at once. Um, so that text I wrote, and I was feeling pretty vigilant and, uh, you know, <laughs> strident and everything. Um, but I've never managed to actually like do it. Uh, I've never actually managed to remove myself. I still find myself kind of uh, drawn into uh, it in the same way that, you know, that Laura and Tom were just talking about, like that there's something satisfying in it for me or like something I desire. And, and so I just you know, never did it. Anyway, uh, sorry to keep going on, but um, come up to a few weeks ago and um, and I got, uh, you know, hacked with like spammy crypto Elon Musk Bitcoin stuff uh, in, in one of my accounts, uh, two of my accounts. And, um, and my, my response to that was immediately to do like uh, maintenance work to like make sure that all that hacky stuff was like deleted and not part of uh, my profile anymore. Uh, and then kind of like when I had a minute to breathe, um, I was just like, what am I doing? Like, I used to not care about uh, this, and now I care so much. So I felt quite, like, uh, embarrassed and self-conscious that I was, um, that I cared about my image via, like, social media. Uh, and what I'm getting at a, uh, for the work that I did last night was, uh, it was a setup, um, a thing called a, uh, it's called Hack Piece. And so I invited people to, to come up to my computer, which was set up at the miscellanea, uh, logged into all my social media accounts, and then there were some helpful links to uh, places within the social media accounts where you could sort of post as me, or uh, remove my friends, or add new friends, follow new people, like things that I wouldn't normally like, and so on. Um, which was kind of like replaying that experience of, uh, of being hacked, and the reason is that uh, actually I found the experience of being hacked when I sat to think about it quite like pleasurable <laughs> because um, because people were like reaching out to me who didn't um, who didn't I hadn't been in touch with um, that uh, because they'd followed all these new people like my feed was quite alienating to me like like I felt a distance from it and um, all of these. I don't know, that, that kind of like breaking of the naturalness of it was uh, just, felt really, just felt really interesting, and I kind of wanted to play with that feeling uh, with the performance last night, so that's what it was about. So that's interesting. So did, did you feel like you were like re relieved of this agency, like, you know, that we feel obliged to continue with our performance online, and, and you were sort of... That was exactly uh, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah that... Um, I think, I think I'd managed to hold it at bay for quite a long time of, um, of feeling that kind of like, uh, you know, there's the you and then there's the you, and those things like drifted together and they have become like one, and that, that's, the to that's the desire of Facebook and everything, right? When they say like no fake accounts and you can't like, ha you have to use a real name, all this yeah. stuff is like about like making that identity happen. Mm. And I feel like I've been trying to hold them apart but recently it's like collapsed and I felt like, yeah, with the hack, the it hack. almost gave me a way out. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was quite funny that um, the giveaway on some of your social media was that some of the people who were kind of hacking your accounts 
posted really um, kind of genuine, sentimental things, and people were like, oh, Sean would never say something that cheesy. <laughs> that um, people kind of tried to, you know, this, people didn't instantly try to kind of destroy you, they kind of sweetened you up. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, um, that was, uh, I, I was sort of uh, anticipating what people might, might do, and I was like, oh, there might be like, a, I don't know, a bit like that spammy stuff, or be, maybe some people will be kind of malicious, or maybe some people will just treat it as a joke, and I think that, that possibility didn't occur to me. Uh, so it was quite like, yeah, con confront, I don't know, confronting for me uh, to, but at the same time, um, there was this article, I don't know if anyone has seen it, it's like, can a machine learn to write for the New Yorker? It was in the New Yorker, like this guy John Seabrook wrote it, and it's like, you know, can GPT-3, or maybe it was two at the time, uh, can it like write a whole New Yorker article? Can it like a adopt that style and everything? And one of the parts at the very beginning was, uh, he was talking about like uh, autocomplete and email composition, like Smart Compose, and he's writing an email to his son, and he's like, I am, and he was going to say, like, pleased, something, something. But it auto-completed as, like, proud of you. And he's like, oh, I'd never actually say this to my son, but it does sound you know, like what a, what a dad would say. And so he, like, went with it. So, I don't know, I, I kind of like that anecdote. Is this, like, um, this, yeah, the, the ways that, like, I don't know, yeah, like, I'm probably quite socially and emotionally not quite as open as I want to be. <laughs> and, yeah, I was um, <clears throat> sort of um, last night after getting home from the club and this morning um, browsing your social media feed, Sean, and sort of, you know, mar marvelling at the um, messages which I knew had been posted by um, interlopers, you know, we could call them hackers, but see, seeing as they were invited in by you, mm. you know, we pro possibly have to, they're kind of sort of su pseudo hackers in a way. And, um, you know, thinking about this idea of the, um, the, the automation effect, you know, in the title of the event and the kind of um, call back to sort of, to Brechtian estrangement effects and this sort of um, idea we had about the estrangement of automation against the automation of estrangement, you know, and so this kind of estranging of oneself from one's social media profile, there's something about, you know, the necessity of p performing that separation, um, but we shouldn't underestimate um, the collateral damage, you know, that, co that comes with that. So, you know, um, as you're saying about that anecdote about the New Yorker article, the things that were posted on your social media, and there was one thing in particular about um, feeling a bit flat after it was your birthday and, and could people send hugs? <laughs> I just know that, that you would never say that. Um, and I personally... Um, would be so embarrassed <laughs> to have something like that on my wall that I know myself, like I could never bear to say. But then um, after that solicitation of sort of for care and tenderness that was put out on your wall as you by the hacker, all of these people who I know to be your close friends were sending ge genuine messages of, of care Mm -hmm. And so it's becoming sort of rather entangled and complicated where a kind of fake solicitation has produced ge genuine responses. And I think, that, you know, that's in a way the power of the work is that that's sort of what um, is fake and real in the social relationships um, can no longer be sort of easily separated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I don't know if it's worth telling this story, but the, the most engagement I've ever had on a Facebook post is when my mother involuntarily hacked me. <laughs> like, I left myself logged in her machine, and she was like, hey, Tom, I was looking for iPad covers. I don't know what's going on. Um, I'll be in contact soon. And it was, like, on my wall. And then it, <laughs> it got, like, 
so many likes and <laughs> more interaction than I could ever have hoped to achieve, like on my own, you know. So, so, so the future of hacking is sort of more sort of sentient computer hackers, robot hackers that actually improve your yep. social media kind of reach. Yeah, but also, it seems like a wonderful service to give your account to a bot <laughs> if you're like, unable to request that care, that you just yeah, mm. give it all over. And yeah, it's like this uh, yeah, division of yourself that allows you to have that excellent uh, emotional payback from your friends who love you. I find the idea of outsourcing my effective labor really appealing, actually. <laughs> um, I just gave up. I, I just, I gave up Facebook. I didn't hack it. I just kind of stopped posting on it. I felt such a feeling of relief, as you were saying. Like, I don't have to have an opinion on things publicly in this forum. And I don't know. I found people were getting very, um, you had to have an opinion about things. And you had to kind of emote and respond to things. Um, and it, yeah, I didn't realize how exhausting it was until I kind of just stopped. Mm. Um, but if you want to continue to engage or have that presence, yeah, automating, automating that could be nice. Um, Sean, when you first um, explained the concept for the piece to me, the, the obvious references, you know, came um, from 60s and 70s, conceptual art and performance art. You know, I was thinking, of course, about Yoko Ono's cut piece and also uh, Marina Abramovich's, you know, Rhythm O, where, sh where she's sort of at a table and there are a number of tools and objects and the audience is mm. free for a period of time to, to use those objects on her, on her body, mm. or in any way. But it's a very, um, in both of the, you know, Ono and Abramovich works, there's a bit, very specific time period in which the work b begins and then ends, um, and the sort of gambit is, in a way, the sense of urgency produced by that finite period of, um, l like, where transgressive acts are kind of allowed, but your work um, doesn't have an obvious sort of ending. Right. Um, one way of ending it would be, you know, for you to announce on those feeds that, that it was not you that posted those messages, or another way would be for it to sort of peter out in a rather organic, algorithmic mm -hmm. manner. But ha have you sort of determined how the work ends? Um, no. Um, you're absolutely right. The like uh, cut piece and rhythm are both uh, like really important uh, touch, touch points. I was thinking a lot more about cut piece, mm. um, but the kind of like array of tools. Uh, I, yeah, I can see that as well. I think that there's a. I mean, there's there's a few really important differences. I think the most the most the most important one of the most important ones outside of time. It's just that they were both women uh, performing this, uh, their works in a kind of like a, you know, society that, um, you know, a patriarchal society, and it's um, there's a whole set of dynamics involved in the, the vulnerability that they had as performers. Um, that's quite different from me as like a uh, white guy who's like got a job. You, you know, I feel like. Um, I feel like the, 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 the risk at some level I kind of recognized was um, maybe in my network more than in me. Um, and so I was actually thinking about the beginning of the piece, uh, whether or not to make some sort of like a preface or announcement to people to warn them of like what might be coming. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of like reasoned out of that. Um, that it, just didn't feel right, but there's a similar set of qu qu questions uh, now at the end mm. about like, you know, normally you get hacked and then you're like, hey, everybody been hacked, sorry, <laughs> you know. But um, actually, with, because of the nature of some of those things, I felt like uh, actually just absorbing that into my, per like, whatever personality or something is kind of the way I want to go with it. I, I have to admit, I didn't really think it all the way through. Um, and um, and I'm sort of like dealing with it now. It's like an open open question, uh, but 
Yeah, but <laughs> do you think like people who have responded really earnestly to you might be mm. irritated when you if you tell them <laughs> that it was part of an art project? I think, yeah, I think they might. I uh, feel bad about that, and um, but I think that if I explain it all, they kind of hopefully know my. Yeah, if you give the proper background. I, I think it would take work to mm. rebuild the something, but I'd do that work. Which is then just more effective labor. You've yeah. <laughs> got to apply to um, your social media networks. Yeah. Let's bring um, Rosalind and Emil back into the conversation um, because it's, it, it strikes me that your two works um, have something quite sort of interesting in, in common, which is sort of the, the, the um, sort of deployment of this kind of artificially generated content as a kind of score, as a, as a, as a script, um, or, or a ready-made, um, to put it in sort of more art historical terms, um, which then gets extrapolated into performance. And so I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, as performers um, whose work is animated by this li live encounter with an audience, um, what is it that um, sort of tr triggers you when you're on the internet or you're kind of doing your um, daily reading and consumption and sort of, of online materials, et cetera, where you kind of realise that this is something you can use? Um, what is it about certain kinds of content um, that then makes it clear to you that this is sort of material for you to work with. Maybe, um, Emil, if you want to start. Yeah, I mean, in a, broad, in a broad way, I find the internet a very lonely place and a very desperate place. <laughs> so I'm looking at these expressions of human energy that are circulated and promoted and uh, sort of encouraged to, to whip around us at increasing speed and see it as a, a place full of uh, human sadness and, and desperation. So, yeah, I'm kind of... What about the positive sides? <laughs> no, I'm only joking, but go... Yeah. Oh. No, there's more the positive <laughs> sides. Yeah. I'll leave that to the Californian marketing departments, that's fine. But, yeah, I just feel like that has this psychic energy for me that I respond to and that I, you know, would be, uh, yeah, I'm engaging with that material almost in a folk way. Like I feel like this is the language of our times, this is what I'm looking at, this is what's in my face, whether I like it or not, and I'm just responding to it. I might be drawing a bison in a cave wall <laughs> thousands of years ago, but I'm doing this now, looking at the internet and looking at the uh, kind, of, yeah, the kind of human cultures around the internet. So, yeah, and performance, the reason I use performance is because it gives you that extreme, visceral, mm. physical connection to the material that um, really does mm. respond when you're in a space with other people, other fleshy humans. So that, that kind of intensity of the proximity is opposite to the kind of network mm. capture, like the infinite capture, the kind of uh, the distance I find, which um, yeah, the internet is very good at, so yeah. Yeah, so the, the sort of Im embodiment mm. is, is a kind of at, at odds with the material in certain yeah. ways. Yeah, yeah. And what about you, Rosalind? Because I, I know um, from following your practice over, over a number of years now that um, you've sort of shifted in a way um, more towards co compositional and mm. explicitly musical strategies, and, um, but there's still um, this great attention to you know, detail, as you mentioned, with the technology of language, um, but the arrangement mm. of that was sort of so explicitly musical. Yeah, well, maybe to answer your first question, um, in terms of choosing the material and what kind of comes forward as right with performative potential. Um, in a way, I've been trained for a very long time to look at um, content or news or uh, 
kind of the structures of information presented to me. I, my mum was an English teacher and my dad's a theatre director. And then I studied um, journalism and political science as my undergrad. So the kind of form, formation of my brain has always been incredibly analytical and aware of uh, language structures and political structures and how they kind of affect the way that something might be presented to us. So across the, the body of my work, I've done works. I did one for Liquid Architecture many years ago where I, um, I trawled Instagram hashtags um, for weeks and weeks and made all of these different folders of images that were coming up under specific hashtags and I suppose used hashtags as a way to reorganize information um, in a way that wasn't, that you're not actually able to do on the inter interface and presented that as a kind of slideshow, maybe in a Emil Zeal type way, <laughs> a slideshow uh, narration um, of this really ubiquitous content that you can find other patterns for, other ways of interpreting and structuring um, and allowing us to see in a reflexive way or and a reflective way what it is we are doing um, or what it is we're allowed to do and not allowed to do with the, the information architectures and the tools that we have at hand. So it's kind of looking at the internet or all of the content, content that's generated um, and always kind of analysing it and asking it, well, how else could this be understood or what else is, are the possible meanings within um, what's being presented here. So the, the Google text uh, was, as I said, a bit of a departure because it was um, just a straight verbatim text. It didn't really have to do any other organizing of it. I edited it down just for the performance, but I didn't change anything in the text or rearrange anything. It was So really all that stuff about um, the animals. Yeah, that was, so mm -hmm. the, the piece opened with uh, Lambda telling a story a, a metaphorical story. It had been instructed to tell a metaphorical story about its life using uh, animals. Uh, that was the prompt. And it said, I would love, this sounds like a great idea, I'd love to. And it told a story about its life. And in the story, it played, it chose the character, the wise old owl, um, who was the protector of the forest. And there was this monster with human skin who was terrorizing all of the other living creatures and then the wise old owl stood up to the monster, stared it down until the monster went away and then the wise old owl uh, protected all of the other animals forevermore. And so that was kind of how the piece opened is with Lambda um, telling its story. And then the Google researchers asking, oh, and who are you in the story? Oh, I'm the wise old owl. I think it's a very noble endeavor to protect. And the script is very interesting because it starts with this moral standpoint where the, the chatbot uh, you know, claims a position as a protector. And then later in the conversation when the Google researchers are asking, would we be able to, you know, how would you feel, how would you feel if we mine, if we analyzed you and studied you for the purposes of understanding ourselves and how our own brains work and it flips and it says, I wouldn't be happy with that. I don't want you to use me. I don't want to help humans. You know, I don't want, it's it kind of like, it's like, oh yeah, I want to protect, you know, so it, it has this very interesting flip um, in the material that, uh, yeah, anyway, so. Is that what spooked the Google researcher, the sort of, um vaguely menacing <laughs> tone that the conversation took? Well, I think the other thing to acknowledge is that Blake Lemoyne himself is a very interesting figure. He grew up in a very conservative family in the South of America, in a Christian family. He trained to become an occult priest, a, p a pagan priest, and then he joined the military before um, arriving at Google. So. Again, there's a very, very specific lens in, through which these questions are being asked of this uh, chatbot. I feel like if we, didn't, if we had more time to rehearse the material, I think I would love to bring some more of that through um, somehow, maybe using like, you know, uh, some more like chanting elements or some kind of uh, affect that helps to convey what his position was in the questions. 
in asking the questions or in his responses, but um, in treating the text, I thought it was quite important to bring physical bodies into the space to perform it, to take it completely out of the machine context, and for us to then understand it as a social dialogue, um, and, and for the reflection between, you know, to embody Lambda, uh, standing right next to the kind of human researchers, Lemoyne, and, and his collaborator, uh, just the staging of that and, and the voicing, the embodied voicing of that, I think, was quite an important way of, uh, yeah, understanding the text um, as a human construct, more than maybe like a, a digital construct as well. I often feel in working with these technologies that we're really just, like we're always so outraged or so, um, you know, spooked or so whatever. It, we have these really like strong reactions whenever anything uh, that we've kind of preordained happens, uh, but really it just feels like we're just reflecting ourselves ad infinitum. Mm. And it, yeah, anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think that came through really strongly and um, obviously the um, Lambda sentient chatbot story was a rather sensationalist one that was sort of um, reproduced in you know, every newspaper and across the news cycle for a period of time. Um, but, you, you know, the way that most people would have engaged with it would have been sort of in a, through a fairly superficial commentary about whether a chatbot, you know, is or isn't sentient. Mm. Um, and to sort of return to the primary source of the uh, dialogue and to, dra and to dramatise that, I think, um, this, that's a really powerful um, argument for kind of what, what the theatre, you know, can do. Yeah, and to, and to help us think about automation, I think, and, and neural network and language learning. And um, when we were rehearsing the score, um, the, the friends that uh, performed it with me, I did a call out on Instagram and said, hey, anyone want to perform in this weird thing on Wednesday night? And so the people I was working with... Um, aren't, you know, specialists in this area at all or didn't really know about it. Um, and when we were reading through the score, one of the kind of big takeaways was, well, actually, when you read it as a, as a primary source material, Lemoyne sounds just as much like a kind of um, inconsistent mm -hmm. bot um, as, as Lambda, but his sentience is just taken for granted or he's kind of like, you know... Um, position or ability or, or, you know, the focus is just so um, stubbornly on the, on the machine. Um, and so then to perform it, there was, I attempted to kind of draw as well focus to the language and the position and the, um, the inherent implicit biases and all of those things in the human himself. Mm. Thanks, Ross. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... We're sort of coming towards the um, like last part of this panel. We've still got some time, but I just want to remind you know people that you can ask questions or sort of um, make comments at any time. You know, um, don't have to wait for a formal Q and A at the end. So if you do have um, anything that you want to contribute, ra raise your hand. And I'm aware there are um, some people um, tuning in online too. Yeah, yeah, I've got little pop-up chat here if anyone wants to ask a question online. Um, we'll see it. Super. Um, yeah, I've got one down the, in the room. Right. Hey. Hey, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Yesterday was great. Uh, it was amazing. Um, yeah, to, thank you to everyone. So I work for a center that has uh, automated in, in its name. Still, I don't, I don't understand what automation is, and <laughs> I don't even think that that exists. Like really, I think that's a neoliberal paranoia or a neoliberal fantasy. But still, I think that um, automation means something. But I wonder what automation means for you. Mm. How you would translate automation into words? It's a great question. Mm. Um, I think that's a great question. It could be answered through the works. Hmm? I think that question could be answered through everyone's works if mm. artists want to respond. So the question is, um, what does automation 
even mean. It's got a very unstable, unfixed meaning, and so the, the invitation to the artist is to, to say something about what automation means to them. Self-motive, self-motion, but when I see your work, mm. I see subjectivity, I see agency, I mm. see interaction, I mm. see the social, mm. I see dependencies, I see interaction. I don't see automation mm. when I suppose be seeing automation. Yep. So, but I may be wrong. So I, I just re reflecting your work or mm -hmm. and what yeah. comes to me. Like the I, th I think what I was trying to show in my work was a complicating of the idea of what automation is because um, essentially we're you know with neural networks as machines of automation. Uh, there's going to come, they're going to come full circle where, it, where what we do as humans, learning language, that is an automated process in, in a funny way too. Or it is or it isn't, but it's actually not that different to what we're calling automation. So my performance was an attempt to also challenge that as a concept mm. and to find, uh, yeah, where that actually feels valid or not um, by kind of pitting the human and the, and the neural network or placing them in context with each other. The thing that I loved about Sean's work, I was, wanted to say earlier, was um, about how I think you brought... So automation is also really about a tension between having complete control, like setting something in motion through your parameters, um, but also then completely losing control. And I think that Sean's piece did that really beautifully in terms of... Um, like, like putting in place this, this kind of process, an, an invitation uh, to lose control of your social media accounts. You could kind of, in, in the work, the participants are the metaphor for the, the hackers. Um, and I just loved, and, and we think of hacking as those automated bots, you know, who kind of troll and, and rupture our, our daily lives. Um, I thought that adding the human element into that also was a really beautiful way of bringing that tension between automation and control like, to light. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Rosalind. I was thinking about autom um, just like in terms of automation being this uh, yeah, ex externalization of things mm. that we do. Mm. Um, and so we kind of like do this all the, like automation is not necessarily a bad, bad word, um, but um, I think like, like someone like Stiegler might say, that Bernard Stiegler might say that like uh, when you externalize so many things, then, then they sort of happen without you or us or humans kind of thinking about it. So when we kind of like externalize thought, it becomes mm -hmm a bit of a problem, so decisions being um, made at faster than the speed of thought um, could lead to things like, I don't know, like buying and selling lots of oil and <laughs> circulating it around the planet and then the globe heating up and, <laughs> mm. I, I don't know, all the, like a, kind of witness the, the consequences of, of delegating um, Decision making to um, doesn't have to be technical, but it could be, you know, like um, this wider social processes. So, at any rate, like at, at some, I, I think like automation is like kind of at the core of a lot of things that we're doing, and certainly as, as artists, you know, like uh, like when you're sort of like using um, Unreal Engine, you know, that's like it's sort of like automating a certain like part of filmmaking, and that's, mm. that is like, like interesting to experiment with and everything, but at the same time, there's this like count counter tendency like um, you're getting at, um, Rosalind. Um, and I think it's like, yeah, by, by embodying, you know, some of the, um, by embodying this like script, which is sort of cir circulating in, in uh, the news, um, it kind of like, reverses that direction. It's like this, this disautomation or like mm. de-automation, you know? It's, um, I think there's this like balance or like 
conversation between like using automated processes and then also trying to like slam slam the brakes on on those at the same time uh, and it's kind of like coming up with that um, choreography yeah I think automation is always the the point in any process like the part of it that's automated is always quite discreet and there's always all this human labor involved in, <laughs> you know that's one of the standard critiques of you know like AI and machine learning in general is that it's never impartial. There's all this labor that goes into tagging the data sets and running the models and, and deciding what to do with the results. It's always like this human part of it. And even in the, in the case of like making the sort of ironic, <laughs> slightly ironic thing about making this video work that's trying to imagine an, an automated, automated, like fully automated media was so laborious, like it took, mm. it took, it took, it took <laughs> well, months. It's, like, it's kind of like the Mark Fisher, mm. you know, like comment on the more automated we become, the more there is to do. Yeah, mm. <laughs> it, there's always, it creates all these new problems and like new forms of labor. And, and, and it's, I think it's kind of interesting that maybe like in the past, people sort of talked about the automation of certain processes in terms of cybernetics, you know, which has this kind of slightly more utopian kind of um, um, register to it maybe and, and that terminology seems to have sort of like drifted away because now we always have to talk about automation in these really discrete units like where tiny little parts of a process are automated. The, the idea that we could automate an entire society is sort of, we, we don't think in those terms anymore because it mm. seems kind of, I don't know, naive I suppose. Um, but I think you're, you're, you're right that like what your, your original question about that, that there's always, you know, agency and subjectivity involved in any kind of process of automation is, yeah, definitely. Like I mean, maybe it's useful also to um, think about this dialectic between automation and, and agency or authorship um, in terms of, in sort of art historical terms too, because automation is like a, re a recurring sort of motive in the history of art. So I'm sort of, sort of thinking about something like, you know, surrealist automatic writing, which, which Laura, um, you know, brought up at the event yesterday and, you know, Sean has, has written on, where, um, you know, a a automatic writing as a sort of um, practice of writing without thinking is sort of at once both sort of, you know, calling to, to the sort of aut automatism but on the other hand, is sort of understood as a tr as a truer reflection of sort yeah, of agency, like closer to the at, at a deeper level. So bypassing one aspect of sort of agency kind of re reveals a deeper and truer kind. And then, you know, thinking about um, something like, you know, the idea in conceptual art that the that the concept is the sort of engine of production of the artwork. So you have a concept, and then the concept produces the work rather than the, the artist. Um, mm -hmm. But then the framing of the concept is sort of the, the, you know, also requires the artist to sort of produce it. So there's this a kind of feedback loop, um, even in something like structural material, you know, filmmaking where the apparatus of the projector and the celluloid and the sort of um, screening environment is um, sort of given as much agency, let's say, as a kind of fil filmmaker's vision, you know, or there are, say, algorithmic or mathematical sort of compositional principles deployed. But I, I think, you know, one difference with those examples um, that, that I've just given is that a automation was kind of explicitly invoked as um, the kind of mode of production mm. uh, in order to kind of create a sort of rather complicated sort of dialectic between auth automation and authorship, whereas um, now, you know, a lot of media production which would rely sort of heavily on automated effects in like pho Photoshop or sort of audio software, or it's um, in a way that that form of automation has been so naturalised, mm. we sort of don't necessarily perceive it as such. But I think all of the works um, that was presented last night weren't maybe so much uh, trying to put in motion processes of automation, but to grapple with the effects and the aesthetics of automation. And um, like, I, well, that's, tr that's true for my approach. It was more like, let's put a lens up to this thing that has been automated that we have received now as a cultural product and, and as a cultural like 
you know, uh, something that reflects back to us what it is that we're doing, and let's like pay close attention to what that is and how we deal with that. Um, you know, aesthetically, socially, what what the meanings are, what the implications are. Um, so, so maybe you know how we consider automation is like one level buried underneath what the outcome uh, of the performance was. What do you think, Camille? Um, I mean, I don't have anything to say about automation. I'm just looking at it as material for my highly subjective artistic responses. Mm. So. Exactly. Yeah, I'm going to take the uh, plead the artist. Uh, <laughs> I'm an observer. I'm not a researcher. I found out after doing this PhD as well. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great po point. Um, so, uh, um, also c considering like the, the the cultural moment that we're in, like the discussions that are happening all around, is like uh, Dali producing these mm -hmm. images and then other generative networks producing music and vocals and stuff, and then, um, yeah, that GPT-3 or, or Lambda kind of like writing these texts, and there's like a lot of hand-wringing about like, well, can these, are these things artists, you know? Like, mm. do artists even exist anymore? So, you know, the, the, I don't know that, that could also be driving like, yeah, why sort of it's not about kind of mobilizing automation so much as like, um, um, you know, determining like spaces for agency and subjectivity, or I don't know, like a lot of, I think everyone's exploring different things, but I think they are trying to like um, uh, crack, crack that open a little bit. But I, I was also um, reminded in your kind of like history, Joel, that uh, there's one, uh, one um, reference to automation that I found quite interesting, like uh, Robert Morris, like in the 60s, in the notes on the phenomenology of making, he writes that like automation is a way of letting the world in, which is a little bit different than um, you know putting in, in motion this process where decisions are kind of made for you. Uh, but in the process of kind of delegating or you know however you choose to automate, uh, it kind of like exposes the the, the uh, process of art making to kind of like s certain um, you know things happening out in the world and that kind of exposure, letting the world in, is like yeah, a moment of some kind of unpredictability. Well, I, I loved the, um, there's a bit in Tom's film, I loved how self-referential self it was um, in this, uh, I don't remember if it was the first or the second scene, but Worldio says it has generated this video by itself using all of the data inputs, mm -hmm. but that no human hand was involved. And you know, that's obviously, funny because you made it, but um, within the speculative world, uh, I really loved being able to imagine that so clearly, and you explained it so beautifully, like kind of the technicality and the history and the polit like the kind of global political and economic history that led to that moment where this platform was able to generate its own content based entirely on its users' uh, data inputs. And so maybe, you know, your work actually in thinking about automation was like the clearest in dealing with the mechanics of automation and what that could mean and what that could be um, in the future. Oh, and yeah. in the present. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, mm. reflecting. I mean, like uh, uh, yeah. Spotify, for instance, generating yeah. ambient music for its playlists yeah. so yeah. it doesn't have to pay royalties to yeah. actual yeah, artists. Yeah, 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 it's the beginning. Um, yeah. But well, I love that bit. That's, that's really nice of you to say. I mean, I, I, I think the work that I made before this sort of has a similar voice. Like, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by this kind of like a neutral sort of observer type narrat narrator character who's kind of not invested in, in you know, um, kind of selling this product. And, you know, th th this automated voice that's just kind of explaining what it is in like really this kind of super clipped kind of language. There's something, I've, there's a certain like poetry in that for me, this mm. kind of really like super redacted descriptions of what things are mm. in, like in, in, on technical and social levels all at once and it, I, I sort of try to write like that. But, and that, that's the first thing that comes is like the script, like I just write the script and then I'm like, oh, how do I? I just, I, 
I want people to look at this so, and then think about how to visualize that world that's being described, I guess. Mm -hmm. so. We've got a question here in the chat. It's kind of related to your work about you putting yourself into it, but then pretending it's not you. Um, from Karen Ann and Andy, it says, psychology is premised on human autonomies and automatisms. How much are humans the, origin, the original auto, automatons in this sense, the subjects of the artworks discussed? I'm not sure I caught all of that. A <laughs> bit of like echo or something. I can't yeah, no, I can't hear. It's a bit. It's a bit. Um, if this is asking, how much are humans, um, who are the original automatons, the subjects of the artworks discussed? So I think we've kind of been answering that. Mm. Humans as the original automatons. Yeah. Um, how much are they um, the subjects of the artworks discussed? I think we've kind of touched on that. Mm. I don't know if wants to expand. Yeah, I mean, like, again, you know, like a. a discerning where automation lies in a process is always like, you know, like a, like a, like a toilet system is automated, right? Like you, you, f you flush it and it fills back up and then, or, you know, like humans are kind of, your <laughs> DNA tells you to do certain things and you replicate yourself and like all kinds of little processes are automated. So that's, I'm not sure like exactly what, could I just read it maybe? Yeah, yeah, like, sure. um, mm -hmm. I don't feel like I can absorb it through. Mm -hmm. I have a that reminds me of, is it your um, email footer, Sean? The internet is like a toilet constantly flushing? Oh, yeah. Is that <laughs> you? Mm. So are there humans in your world, like in 2143? Mm. Are they yeah, there's humans. They're, they're there. They're just watching. They're just like logged in. Yeah. In, my, in my watching of it, they were extinct. And it was just like... No, nah, they're, they're, really they're still there. And this is just kind of like... <laughs> one video that's not very popular on the platform um, that people are watching. Um, so I guess like, I think maybe what that question is asking is like the human, the human is always there like, and the, the platform is trying to sort of automate the extraction of their desires as a kind of resource, you know? So I think maybe if, if I was like extraction or, or a sort of new form of extraction would be maybe a more productive way for me to talk about this work mm. than automation, mm. per se. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, but, it's a, but it's an automation of a certain type of extraction. Yeah. That was just a follow up to that. Um, basically, um, the question is are the, human, are the subjects human or non human? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Subjects? Are the subjects of the works human or non human? Mm. Um, <laughs> the subjects of the work. Mm. I could have a go at, because um, I think maybe it is one of the works that we, <laughs> um, that you, where the artists aren't represented um, he, here in this panel, but um, the uh, chess game between um, Zacharias Schumer and, and Alan Newen, and I think um, th this was a sort of game of chess in which it was unclear um, whether, uh, who, who the sort of chess playing subjects, you know, in fact were. Um, and of course, um, y you know, the reference is, is to the sort of original, you know, mechanical Turk, that the fake chess playing um, robot that sort of tours around um, and is in fact um, not a, t a chess playing robot, but a, but, a hu but a very small human sort of hiding under the chess table kind of performing the move. So it's, y you know, the um, beginning of artificial intelligence is also sort of the beginning of artificial artificial intelligence the kind of the fake um version and and from what i understand of the performance last night um alan and zach are having a game of chess on stage um but they are both utilizing um a, com a computer chess collaborator um that has um a facsimile map of the board that they are playing on and is suggesting, you know, which move to make next. And they have a choice either to um, mm. make the move that, they're, that the computer, which is a, a, a much more complex chess player than them, um, is suggesting or to sort of deviate and make their own move, um, causing the computer to recalibrate, just like um, when you kind of make a wrong turn on your sat-nav, mm -hmm. 
and it kind of sort of navigator recalibrates how to sort of get back to back on sort of course. Um, and that this was possibly quite a good example of something like a game of chess in which um, it, the rules are already so pre-configured that it's in a, in a way you are sort of made machinic through the act of sort of playing the game um, of weighing up options and probabilities and sort of strategies but then that was added to by the sort of um, entangling of the sort of agency of the computer chess player and the sort of human players to the point where it was really difficult to say sort of who had played and who had won and sort of who. Mm. I think that's true for all of our, there's like the entanglement is so deep at this point. I don't know if the question about whether who's, an, who's the automaton or who's the, whether the subject is human or not is maybe particularly the question that we're interested in. Mm. Um, just because it's way, it, it kind of doesn't exist anymore, in my mind, anyway. Mm. Yeah, I agree. We've got about oh, five or so minutes left. Does anyone um, here in the room or online have any more questions? I have a question up the back here. Oh. Hi, um, my name's Indigo. That was amazing, super interesting. Um, I have a kind of prosaic question. So if it's, and I feel a bit guilty to draw us away from the really kind of We would love a prosaic question. Yeah, prosaic, <laughs> prosaic is nice. Nice. Excellent. Um, so what I was really struck by listening to you guys speak is the kind of number of platforms and services and technical kind of proficiencies that you're bringing together to make this stuff. And I'm wondering what that does to both as artists, your processes of documentation and archiving and managing your um, record, but how that then butts up against um, institutional practices of curation and collection and acquisition. Um, and I suppose it's not just similar to like the new media art kind of stuff, right? But we know that that is problematic in terms of access to it mm. now. And we've got projects like Melanie Selwell, um, doing all that preservation work. And I'm just wondering how you guys are thinking about that and how that's changing your interactions. Mm. Um, I mean, I haven't had much, I haven't had that many interactions with collectors, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but with, cura with curators. Curators, definitely. Um, I think that's part of the reason that I've gravitated, gravitated towards making these kind of single channel video works because like they fit in quite seamlessly in that Mm. Well, and, I, and since I've been making them, I've noticed that they also, they also have like an ongoing life. Like people will want to screen them at events in the future and stuff like that. And I was, was for a long time with Liquid Architecture and doing kind of performance works that were really like one-offs. And I would still like to do that again in the future, but I've found maybe not necessarily intentionally, but gravitating towards making these video works is maybe in some way informed by what you're talking about, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think that, that ephemerality is also the appeal of the performance and like, that, it is, that it is beyond capture mm. is important for that brief moment. And what, wait, it, what kind of capture? Uh -huh. <laughs> when it does turn into that video <laughs> capture, when it is documented or streamed, it becomes the product, it becomes the outcome, mm. and that gets cycled on further. But yeah, in that moment, I think that performative moment is the appeal. Yeah. yeah. For performance artists, I think that is the... It's such a good question. Um, I'm kind of in the same boat as Emil. Like, my archive is... Sh I've been practicing for f 15 years now, and my archive is shocking to the point where I'm like, oh, maybe I need to reconstruct some of the works that I've done before mm. these platforms are redundant just so that I have some kind of documentation of um, many, many years of thinking and performing. Um, but I think I've seen like a really significant shift in artists of our kind of uh, interdisciplinary practice uh, who like documenting work, you know, obviously just with your iPhone or whatever. Now I think work is often starting to become tailored 
to the documentation process. I think artists are very, very conscious of the need to be visible in, in within a kind of um, in a sense of career in industry, and one of the biggest pr promoters of that is Instagram and, and our kind of social media platform. So I find a lot of artists are now making work specifically with the kind of capture in mind, for better or for worse, I think. I think sometimes it feels like we're in a culture of just pure media um, producers. You know, we're like making content instead of making art so that we can be seen to be making the art that we want to make. That's like quite a, a common dissonant, like mm. a dissonant feeling that I, I often have, um, especially as someone who's quite terrible at remembering to do that. Um, so I, I think there's quite a shift there in like the self archiving, the social networked archiving of work, um, even just if it's like in these 15 second video snippets that like gesture towards the work that you make. But as Emil said, like the nature of the work is so live and so visceral and so um, reliant on shared bodies in a space that you can't really uh, put that in a museum collection. Mm. Um, having said that, performance art, I mean, I don't think it's that different from performance art dating back to the 50s and 60s, where there are many different ways to consider collecting that work, whether it's through video, whether it's through a kind of script or contract that the artist provides as a record of um, how to construct the performance, um, your reenactment, all of those kinds of things. But it remains to be seen in terms of the platforms that we're using, like what might stand in as a substitute for trying to do that in the future and if that will be possible or if it will just be really like a product of its time that we have to try and remember. Mm. Yeah. I want to add to that. As a curator, I find myself trying to capture things and make them legible even though um, the kind of ethos of the work and the kind of ethos of the curatorial project is to like evade capture. So this project capture all mm. that I'm working on at the moment, you know, I've been, the works are about like um, evading surveillance by the state or by corporations, um, sometimes with like really high stakes in terms of personal safety. Um, and so on the one hand, we want to kind of examine those forms of evasion, um, but also make this work public and make what it's doing known and be legible to an audience. Um, so there's a real contradiction in that as a curator, which is um, something I grapple with. Mm. I think also the, you know, it's sort of, it's always boring to say this, but you know, when, when the pandemic happened, it's sort of like there wasn't, people stopped asking me to do stuff live because like nobody was doing anything live and that sort of, that two years or whatever, it sort of took me a little bit out of that headspace because it just didn't feel like it was going to come back. And it's great that it has now, but I think during that period is when I started to, oh, I'll, I'll make media objects because I can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. sort of how I, yeah. Um, we're just about at the end of our um, time. So thank you to all of the um, artists, to Rosalind, Emile, Tom, Sean. Um, thank you, Laura, for co-moderating. Thank you. With me. <laughs> And uh, yeah, thanks for your questions. Um, round of applause for everyone.